Hi, and welcome to Dr. V's AP Chemistry webcast. In this webcast, we're talking about rate laws and the method of initial rates, which is one technique we can use to figure out rate laws. Kinetics is a really important topic in AP Chemistry, and this is a really necessary skill for AP Chemistry students. What do we want to accomplish in this webcast? Well, first we need to introduce rate laws. What are these things? And the idea of the rate constant. We're going to then compare reaction orders and what this means and use the method of initial rates to determine rate laws. And of course, we'll do several practice problems as we go, because I think that's really important. Chemists spend a lot of time talking about reaction rates, and we know from collision theory that the rate of the reaction depends in part on the concentration of the reactants. And in general, we know that when concentration of reactants increases, that reaction rates also increase. But that's too general a statement. We really want very specific quantitative information about this relationship. How does it increase? Does it always increase? What could explain this? And that's really our interest here. So let's, that brings us to the idea of rate laws. We can say that the rate is directly proportional to the reactant concentration, and we always use molarity, raised to some power n. So rate proportional to a, the reactant A, raised to some power n. And n has to be determined experimentally. But there's a drawback to this expression, right? It's a proportionality, and that's not going to be very helpful to us. So we're going to want to make an inequality. We'll do that next. The other thing I want to do before I move on is talk about n, raised to some power n. So n can be any integer. It can even be zero. It can be a fraction. So n is a really important thing because it's really what determines the relationship between rate and concentration. So what we need to do is insert a rate constant, which is called k, it's a proportionality constant, to take the proportionality and turn it into an equation. So rate equals k times a raised to some power n. And we call k the rate constant. I do want to point out k is always written as a lowercase, preferably italicized k. It should not be a capital k. It's got to be a lowercase and be careful about that. So this is what we call a rate law. It's a mathematical expression that relates reaction rate to reactant concentration. Right, so we've got our proportionality constant k, the rate constant, the concentration of a raised to some power. And then n is really the most important part here, right? We have to find the value of the rate constant from experimental data. And that's what we're going to be talking about in this whole webcast. And the value of the rate constant really depends on the reaction conditions. And the biggest thing that affects the value of k is temperature. So n is sometimes referred to, or should be referred to really, as the order of reaction with respect to A. It's really telling us the nature of the relationship. Does it go linearly with A? Does it go with the square of A? Does it go with some other power? The order of reaction with respect to A. And so that's really what N is telling us, right? And the value of N has to be experimentally determined. You cannot figure it out any other way. You have to do experiments, and those are called the well, one way to do that is the method of initial rates, which is the focus of this webcast. All right. And as I said before, it can be any integer, including zero, and can be a fraction. What I didn't mention before is it can also be negative. Now, before you get all freaked out, in the method that we're using, the reaction order is always going to, almost always going to be zero, one, or two for a particular reactant. For the types of experiments that we're doing and in ap chemistry we're really going to mostly see zero one or two so this exponent n the reaction order is really telling us what's going on so let's explore this in a little bit more detail what does it mean so when n is zero we say that it's zero order in that particular reactant and here's how the concentration depends on it if it's zero order if we double the concentration of a the rate isn't affected at all we're not limited to just doubling it, but whatever concentration change we make to A, it won't affect the rate. A lot of times we'll see that N will be one. We call this a first order uh, process in terms of the reactant. So what we might see with a first order process is that when we double the concentration of A, the rate doubles. So it goes linearly with the change in concentration. And the other common one we see experimentally is that N equals two. We say that it's second order in that reactant. What we see for a second order reaction is that when the concentration of A is doubled, the rate quadruples. We go with the square of the change, right? So it's zero, one, or two is the most common 
outcome of the experiments we're going to talk about. So let's talk about how we can find these rate laws. As I said, we have to experimentally determine them. You cannot assume that it comes from the balanced equation, all right? So we have to do experiments to figure it out. Do not assume it's based on the coefficients. One way to collect the information that we need is to do what's called the method of initial rates. And you have to do a series of kinetic experiments where you systematically change the reactant concentration what you, that you start with. And you look at how the rate changes. And you monitor the rate and you figure out the relationship. And that's what we're going to go through right now, some examples of this. So here's a potential situation. Two molecules of A react together to form B. I've got three experiments here where I started with different concentrations of A and I looked at what the rate did. All right, so this is the method of initial rates. I only look at reactants when I'm doing this. We don't pay attention to the products at all. And we don't even need to know the balanced equation to figure this out. So let's look at just trials one and two. When I go from trial one to trial two, I see that the concentration doubles in terms of A. And I also see that the rate doubles when I double the concentration of A. So this tells me that since the molarity doubled and the rate doubled, it must be first order in A. Two over two gives me one. So I can think about it that way if I want to. All right, so it's first order in A. And if we go on and look at trials two and three, we see that the same pattern holds. So that means I can write a rate law. Rate equals K times A raised to the first power. Now I don't have to write that exponent of one, so I'm not going to, but it's first order in A based on the data. And so I write a rate law where it's first order in A. And I do need to make sure I put that rate constant in or it's not correct. Now I said earlier that once we do the rate law, we can actually calculate the rate constant from our experimental data. And here's how we do it. So we have the rate law, we figured that out. And so we can find the value of the rate constant by substituting the rate and concentration data from any single trial. You only get to do it for one trial at a time. You should end up with the same numbers each time, but pick all your data from one trial. So let's actually go ahead and do that. So if we wanna find the rate constant for this rate law that we wrote, we can rearrange it to isolate K. I can pull the rate from trial one. I can pull the concentration from trial one. I just chose trial one randomly and substitute those in and I get a number. And if I look at my units, molarity cancels out, right? So I'm left with units of seconds to the minus one or inverse seconds. We're gonna come back and talk about the units of rate constants a little bit more because they can get kind of complicated, but it's also very doable, all right? So we can work them out, but we'll talk about this a little bit more. And it is a constant. So if my data is reliable, I should get the same value for the rate constant from any of the three trials. Now, what if there's more than one reactant involved? How do we handle those situations? We absolutely can, all right? So we end up needing to do additional trials. So we can figure out the concentration dependence on A and the concentration dependence on B, and what that does to the rate. We have to do each one for each reactant independently. So we need to do a series of trials where A is held constant and B changes, and then a series of trials where B is held constant and A changes, and look at what that does at the rate. So we just need to do multiple trials, All right? And then once we have figured out the orders for A and B, the sum of those exponents is called the overall order of the reaction. So N plus M in this situation. Now I said earlier that I was going to come back and talk about units for the rate constants. It turns out that the units depend on the overall reaction order when we want to know the units for the rate constant. So we have to have that rate law first and it gets a little complicated. So let's summarize it all, all right? So like I said, the overall reaction order determines the units of the rate constant. If the reaction order is zero overall, which is unusual, but if it were to happen, the units end up being molarity per second. First order reactions are very common and the units for the rate constant in a first order reaction are seconds to the minus one. Oh, but you want to be really careful here. We're not always going to measure our time in seconds, right? So if your measurements for time were in minutes or hours, it'd be inverse minutes or inverse hours. It's really inverse time that you should be arriving at here. If the reaction is second order overall, it's inverse molar inverse seconds. There's a little bit of a pattern here. And if it's third order overall, it'd be molarity to the minus two and then inverse seconds. So 
you need to know this. I really recommend that AP Chemistry students memorize these because it's a very common question once you've worked out the rate law to ask you what would the rate constant be? What would its value be? And what would its units be? And if you can just write that down, it's so much faster than trying to figure it out. Of course, you can figure this out from the rate law. But, you know, if you're in a time crunch, if you're feeling a little pressured because maybe it's, I don't know, a test, uh, memorizing these can be very helpful. Okay, so let's do an example where we're going to use the method of initial rates to figure out a rate law. Here's the balanced equation that we're interested in. And here's the experimental data. So notice I've got trials where the concentration of ClO2 is constant and where I change the, the concentration of hydroxide. And then I've got, con I've got experiments where the concentration of hydroxide is constant and I'm changing the ClO2 molarity. And then I look at what that does to the rates. All right. So what's the reaction order with respect to ClO2? So to figure this out, we're going to look at trials one and two. Why? Because in those trials, the hydroxide ion concentration isn't changing, but I am changing the ClO2 concentration, right? And in fact, in trials one and two, the concentration of ClO2 doubles, but the hydroxide ion concentration does not change. What does that do to the rate? And if you need to get out your calculator, go ahead and do that. But what I see is that the rate changed fourfold, right? So to summarize, when the ClO2 concentration doubles and the hydroxide ion concentration is constant, the rate quadrupled. What does that tell me? That tells me that this reaction is second order with respect to ClO2, all right? Because four over two is two is another way you can think about it. But this would be a nice, concise justification of your answer. Okay, let's go on and do the same kind of reasoning to figure out the reaction order with respect to the hydroxide ion. So again, I need trials where the ClO2 concentration is constant and the hydroxide ion is changing. So for that, I want to look at trials two and three. So if I look at trials two and three, it's very easy to see that the ClO2 concentration is not changing. But the hydroxide ion concentration goes from 0.1 to 0.05. So that's a twofold change. Well, how did the rate change? Well, it changed twofold from 0 0.230 to 0.115. So for trials two and three, when the hydroxide ion concentration doubles and the ClO2 concentration is held constant, the rate doubles. What does that tell me? It's first order with respect to hydroxide ion, all right? Because well, two over two is one. We have a couple of ways we can talk through that. But again, here's a nice, concise justification with my reasoning as to why I decided it was first order. So. Now that we've done that analysis, we can go ahead and write a rate law. It's got to be second order in ClO2 and first order in OH minus. I actually went ahead and wrote in that superscript one for the hydroxide, but I don't really need to, but I did anyway. Why? Because I wanted to highlight it and point out that the reaction is third order overall. All right, so I've got my rate law, it's third order overall. And the next thing we're going to do is to figure out the value of the rate constant. We can use data from any single trial to figure this out. I'm going to use experiment one because that's what I feel like doing, but I would get the same value no matter which trial I pick. So we had the rate law. We wrote that down. I'm going to rearrange it to isolate K, the rate constant, and I'm going to substitute in the rate from trial one and the ClO2 concentration and the hydroxide ion concentration. Just plug that in. I evaluate that. I get a value of 230 molarity of the minus two per second, right? It's third order overall, so I do need to make sure that my units match that. And these are the kinds of problems that AP Chemistry students are expected to be able to solve at the end of the kinetics unit. So let's summarize what we've done in this webcast. We can use the method of initial rates to determine the reaction order for each reactant in the balanced equation. The reaction orders usually work out to be zero, one, or two when AP chemistry students are doing these kinds of problems. And we have to do the experiments to figure out the reaction orders. Rate laws then can be written to describe that relationship where the reaction orders give us the power to which each reactant is raised and it gives us that relationship. And then we can use the rate laws and our experimental data to find the value of the rate constant. And of course, we have to look at the overall reaction order to end up with the correct units for the rate constant. If you found this helpful, please subscribe to my channel and leave a comment and keep doing chemistry every day. That's the way to get good at doing chemistry.